and I wouldn't want it to happen to anyone else. Ten weeks later, Janie's mutilated body is found, dumped in a field outside the city. Janie's mother, Angela, fights for 13 years to bring the killer to trial. But a conviction hinges on testimony from an informant with his own violent criminal past. He had an appalling record. Somebody was going to die out there, presumably a young blonde. Will justice ever be served in the case of Janie Shepard? On February 4th, 1977, bubbly 24-year-old Janie Shepard bounces into the house she shares with her cousins, excited about the weekend she is about to spend with her boyfriend. She'd gone upstairs to change and wash her hair and get ready for going out in the evening. She came dashing downstairs late and said, I must rush and I have to pick up some food before getting to Roddy's flat and said, right, I'm off. Janie Shepard never arrived at her boyfriend, Roddy Kincaid Weeks' apartment. After some time, I started ringing around um, as many hospitals and police stations as I could think of that would be relevant given the likely route that she would have taken. But when Janie's mud-splattered car turns up in Notting Hill, West London, it's obvious something much more serious has happened. The car has been the scene of a titanic struggle. There are traces of blood, and two ominous knife slashes mark the roof. The police suspect a violent, sexually motivated attack. When they saw the car, because of the state of the interior, they believed they had a murder inquiry. Detective Chief Superintendent Henry Mooney heads up the case. He makes a nationwide appeal for information. I believe that on the night of 4th of February, when she was in her car, she was approached by a stranger who probably forced her to drive him away or he drove her away. I believe he has killed her and has dumped her body out in the country. Janie's mother, Angela, and stepfather, John Darling, join the search. We just hope that somebody has seen her somewhere or seen something that's going to help because otherwise it's, it's just the most terrible feeling. Over 50 officers scour the countryside looking for Janie, but find nothing. Henry Mooney tries a different approach. He starts going through old police files, searching for a perpetrator with the same M.O. What Henry Mooney did, he asked for all the files in relation to similar offenses with this particular method of approaching females in cars and then abducting and raping them. After searching all the relevant criminal method files, Mooney emerges from his office with the name of 37-year-old mechanic, David Lashley. He came out of his office with the file of Lashley in his hand and said, this is the man we want. David Lashley is well known to law enforcement. He's a serial sex offender, dubbed the Beast of Notting Hill, who has served time for raping five women in West London. But at the moment, he's out on parole. He had received a 12-year sentence for a series of rapes, all following the same modus operandi. He was jumping the passenger's seat of a car driven very often by a blonde white woman, produce a knife and direct her to go to a quiet place where he would rape her. What's more, while searching through old files, Mooney finds an attempted murder case with a striking similarity to the suspected abduction of Janie Shepard. Just eight months ago, the victim, known as Miss A, had been attacked in her car less than a half mile from where Janie's car had been found in Notting Hill. And the assailant had also used a knife. Miss A was in, in her car. A man tapped on her window and pointed to his wrist to us as if he wanted to know what the time was. She either wound down her window or opened a door to tell him and a knife was put straight at her and she was made to move across. Miss A was driven to a quiet street, raped, dressed again, then raped a second time. 
After he'd done that, his words to her was, I've got to kill you so you can't identify me. The attacker very nearly succeeded in carrying out his threat. I was an investigating officer for 12 years. I've never read a statement like the statement that I read that she made. <laughs> Having failed to break her neck or suffocate her, he resorted to trying to cut her wrists, and he cut them incredibly deep and left her, left her for dead. Miraculously, Miss A survived. Instinctively, Chief Superintendent Mooney linked Miss A's case to David Lashley. And sure enough, Miss A picked Lashley out in a lineup. In February 1977, only a few weeks after Janie Shepard's disappearance, David Lashley was taken into custody for the attack on a previous victim known as Miss A. At trial, he's found guilty of rape and attempted murder and sentenced to 18 years. Miss A's case proves that Lashley had graduated from rapist to a potential murderer. But once back in prison, he refuses to answer any questions about the suspected abduction of Jamie Shepard. If someone um, doesn't wish to be interviewed and they're in prison, you can have an interview, but if they say nothing, then um, you can't force them to speak. As police continue to search for the young heiress, no new suspects emerge. Then, on April 17th, two months after Lashley's arrest, police make a grisly discovery. Janie's body is discovered 40 miles outside London in an area known as No Man's Land Common. It's a location David Lashley visited frequently. The relevance of No Man's Land Common is that Lashley used to go with his wife and visit his sons. They used to take those boys on No Man's Land Common to play cricket. He even tried to teach his wife to drive in a place called Devil's Dyke, which is adjacent to No Man's Land Common, which took him to the area where the body was. But despite this latest connection, police still don't have enough to charge Lashley with Janie's murder. In 1977, there was no DNA analysis to compare Lashley's DNA to traces found in Janie's car. So all the evidence is circumstantial. The case goes cold. 11 years later, in June 1988, eight months before David Lashley's parole date, Janie's mother, Angela Shepard, writes a letter to Hartsfordshire police asking about the status of her daughter's case. Her letter triggers a reinvestigation. Well, Lashley was a suspect in the earlier investigation, but when I was given the, 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 the brief, I very carefully decided to keep an, an open mind. As an investigating officer, one has to do that. Detective Chief Inspector Ian Winnett and his team review Janie Shepard's case file, but generate no new leads. They check up on Lashley in Franklin Prison in Durham, North England, where he's finishing his sentence for the rape and attempted murder of Miss A. They talk to prison guards, but hear nothing to raise suspicions. Suddenly, they get an incredible break. Four months after I had visited Franklin Prison, I received a phone call from the security officers I'd met there telling me that an inmate had come forward to a prison officer saying that Lashley had given great detail as to how he had murdered Jenny Shepard. The inmate in Franklin is nervous to be an informant, but he's willing to make a statement. I think the inmate came forward because he was horrified when he was told of the circumstances of the murder and that he had a wife and a daughter, and no matter what his background was, he felt he was doing everybody a favor by protecting him from this individual who he felt certain would go out and kill somebody else. The statement the officer brings back to St. Albans police is remarkable. It was in such detail, and it contained facts which had never been put into the media. Uh, only the person who had killed Janie would know the detail. Armed with the informant's testimony, police finally have enough to charge David Lashley with the murder of Janie Shepard. They plan to arrest Lashley as soon as he leaves Franklin Prison. Due to an intricacy of English law, he cannot be arrested inside. He must walk freely out of the prison gates. So authorities devise a risky plan to ensure that Lashley does not escape.
David Lashley must exit Franklin Prison before police can arrest him for the murder of Janie Shepard. Prison guards release Lashley with a tactical unit nearby. He must walk through the prison gates. He was arrested and put into a, a, a large van with them um, and, uh, and handcuffed to our largest officer um, and conveyed with several stops, because it's quite a long journey, down to St. Albans. On February 17, 1990, 13 years after Janie Shepard was murdered, David Lashley arrives at St. Albans Crown Court. To ensure he gets a fair trial, the jury will not be told the nature of his past crimes. Lashley had an appalling record, but only a very small portion of that was known to the jury. Uh, obviously, rules prevent bad character generally being put before a jury. Despite the lack of information about Lashley's past, those in attendance in the courtroom are stunned by his appearance. You're immediately struck by, I suppose, the size of the man and the power he seemed to possess. He looked extremely strong. Not the tallest of men, but um, you got the feeling that there was an immense strength and very, very calm and almost relaxed. Janie Shepard's mother, Angela, is not intimidated by the man she believes killed her daughter. She is the first witness called by the prosecution. She wanted to give evidence in the witness box, and uh, her evidence, in fact, was relatively uh, formal. What she was able to do was to identify her daughter's body by reference to a ring that her daughter was wearing. Next, details of Janie's autopsy are presented to the court. She was not strangled, but died from compression of the neck. Her throat had been crushed. Photographs of the interior of Janie's car are also presented as evidence. The prosecution highlights the seatbelts. They had been half cut with a knife, then manually ripped through. No one with ordinary strength could have done that. They did tests. Uh, enormous tests to try and see what strength a person would need to pull the rest of the seatbelt to break it. And normal strength wouldn't cover it. Lashley's strength is obvious just by looking at him, but he'd also kept records of the weights he'd lifted in the prison gym. They were huge weights. In fact, it was said that some of those weights were actually greater than Olympic records. The prosecution now braces itself for the testimony of their star witness, convicted felon turned prison rat, Daniel Reese. The problem always is that a jury is naturally uh, reluctant to rely on such a person's word. The prosecution begins to roll out their case against David Lashley. In a bold yet calculated move, they call prison informant Daniel Reese to the stand. Reese and Lashley lifted weights together in prison and used to be friends. The prosecution starts going through Reese's statement. Reese was able to tell the jury that in this um, confession, Lashley had told him how on the night Janie disappeared, he was in the Queensway area of Bayswater. And his words to um, Reese were that he'd seen a nice looking girl going into a shop. Reese testifies that Lashley told him he spotted the for sale sign in Janie's car and waited nearby. Lashley's account to Reese was that he'd engaged her in conversation about the car um, and then produced a knife and bundled Janie into the vehicle. He then raped her and it was as he raped her that he that he killed her. And he gave Reese a demonstration of the way he did it. Um, he put his left hand round the back of Reese's neck and then he pushed the knuckle part of his of his fist into um, Reese's throat, the front the front area of the neck. And his uh, that was uh, uh, the way Lashley described that he had killed Janie, that he uh, that she was choking and um, she eventually she died. Reese's graphic description explains the mystery of how Janie died from compression of the neck. His account went on that uh, he redressed her, not in the clothes that um, he'd taken from her because they were ripped to smithereens, um, but he dressed her in a change of clothing that Janie had with her that night, um, and then strapped her into the car, 
and driven out of London. According to Reese, Lashley told him that he dumped Janie's body at a Lover's Lane area, a match to No Man's Land Common. He made the point as well um, that Janie had been swaying from side to side in the car as, as, as they drove out, uh, which he found amusing and laughed. After the prosecution rests, it's the defense's turn to call its star witness, David Lashley's aunt and alibi, Mrs. Earthra Smith. She testifies under oath that Lashley was at her house in bed on the night Janie died. She says she looked in his room and saw him. During cross-examination, the prosecution questions Mrs. Smith about the evidence she gave at the trial of Miss A, who Lashley raped and attempted to murder just before Janie Shepard disappeared. When the alibi evidence was given by his aunt, it was identical to the alibi evidence that was given in 1977 at the trial of Miss A. Identical evidence. The jury is left to make up their own minds as to whether Earthra Smith was telling the truth. If they believe her over Daniel Reese, they will side in Lashley's favor. Almost six weeks after the trial began, the jury is sent out to deliberate their verdict. While the jury was out, there was a very curious feeling, actually. If Lashley had walked out of that court on a not guilty verdict, there is nothing in this world more certain than that he would have done it again. Um, he had a record which showed that he would do this. He was extremely dangerous. And so it's on a knife edge in one sense. If the jury had said not guilty, somebody was going to die out there, presumably a young blonde. It takes just over two hours for the jury to return. They find David Lashley guilty of the rape and murder of Janie Shepard. Outside the courthouse, Janie's family remains calm and dignified, just as they had during the entire 13-year investigation and trial. I think it's absolutely marvelous that justice has been done. She took me behind the arm and she just said, thanks, Mick. And that meant everything to me. And it still does. Well, justice was done in the sense that he was convicted and sentenced to life. Justice could be slightly undone if he was ever let out. He must never be let out, this man. He must never, ever be let out.